Hey, hey, hey. Time for another out of this world story from our space. I have separated from my partner of nearly seven years a day after learning of her cheating on me. Backstory. My partner of nearly seven years had sex with another man last year, and I suspect she has been emotionally and physically cheating on me for at least the past six months up until today. I discovered this last night and left a goodbye letter on the table this morning. I'm starting the process of figuring out who it is that I am and how I can move forward from here. I'm writing this as a bit of a journaling exercise, maybe for some support from people who have been through the same. Thanks for being so welcoming. We've been together since 2015, and early on, I planned for this to be a lifelong relationship. It was rocky along the way, and this is part of the reason I never managed to propose. However, there is still a very mature ring fund, which will go somewhere else now, I'm sure. Around 2019, I began to think that maybe our relationship was not going to be like how I had imagined it. We fought a lot. Nothing physical, of course, just disagreements and mutual pouting and discontent. Our sex life dropped off significantly after 2016 for medical reasons, and it never really seemed to recover. In June of last year, we had a DNM where she said, in as many words, that I did not satisfy her. I had never satisfied her, and the thought of me in bed made her sick. It was very upsetting at the time, and in hindsight, I should have called a relationship then. But we decided initially that we would try to work our way through our problems, and we also ended up having a four-month COVID-19 hard lockdown shortly afterward, so I didn't want to throw her onto the street or anything. Around September, I discovered she had been sexting some guy overseas, a total breach of trust, but I decided I would bracket it because there was nothing physical, and even though we never discussed it openly, I thought she knew that I knew. I never broached this directly, but we eventually decided we would go to couples therapy. I discovered yesterday that she slept with another man in November last year while she was out of town on a short holiday. Some random she met online and I presumed she had been chatting with for a few weeks at least. I didn't care to ask for the exact date, but it was either shortly before or shortly after our first couples therapy session. When she went to work today, I left a note on the table saying goodbye, packing a bag, and went to my parents' place for a few days. This evening after she came home, we had an hour-long SMS-only discussion. I don't want to talk about it out loud. I can't put my words together in time to speak them. Where she took responsibility for everything, promised to change, and asked if I would come back. I appreciated her honesty. I believe everything she has said. This is completely unlike her, something she acknowledged, and she is afflicted by both mental illness and gruesome sexual trauma as a child and young adult. But I said that this was a hard barrier for me, and I would not consider coming back even if we continue to seek couples therapy for this issue. I said I would consider going back to our therapist to work through the breakup process, as we had discussed this previously in one of our sessions, and I can see how it could be helpful. It is also something our therapist had worked on. Even if we could make our way past this, and she found a way to fix herself, it would always be a part of our past, and something I will never be able to reconcile myself with while we were in a relationship. I don't fully believe that there has only been one other man, I asked how many other people she has had sex with during our relationship, and she said one. But I think this might have been a very strict definition of sex, and that she has been emotionally and physically cheating with several other men over the, at least the past six months, and even up until now. She said that this is a part of her life which feels like it's without consequence, and although that is obviously wrong, I can understand what she is saying. Anyway, the number doesn't matter. One is one too many. I feel very dirty for how I found all this out especially since I was going by a gut feeling. But I feel partially vindicated by my gut being right. I don't know if I could shake this feeling of shame for having been able to discover this, even though it is for the best that I know and that we separate. I will likely be moving my appointment with my own therapist forward a few weeks to help with where I go from here. I don't quite know how she moves on from this, but I'm trying my best to focus on myself. I don't know what I will do with myself yet, because so much of who I am, what I do, what I'm like, revolves around what we were. I picked up my guitar for the first time in a few months and couldn't do much with it. I don't play as much now because I felt embarrassed playing around her. Not her fault, she was always very encouraging of all my creative pursuits. I have a few friends, but I'm both a very reserved person and also someone who gets lonely easily. I might need to house share because I don't know if living alone is a good idea for me right now. I did say that I hope we can be friends one day, and I really do. Besides the infidelity and our other problems, she's great, and we did gel in a very cool way. But in my heart of hearts, it doesn't seem likely. At the very least, as soon as either one of us starts seeing someone else, 
unless they're super chill, I don't think it's going to work. I've decided that I'm not going to be super candid with other people about the circumstances of our breakup. There's no need to be, but it's something that I would mention to a future partner, and I can imagine for them that it would be a bit weird for your partner to be friends with her ex, who is also a cheater. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. She will likely move to another city, and we won't have much opportunity to see each other again anyway. Anyway, that's my story. There were times this morning when I thought I might try to just let it slide and forget about it. But I'm glad the part of me which stood fast won over. Because there was really no future knowing this. It would always eat at me. I don't know what the future holds, and I'm truly scared because I have had struggles with alcohol and smoking in the past, which my partner really helped me to temper. I saw smoking as a condition of getting the other, which I'm grateful for, maybe with a sneaky cigarette every now and then at the pub. And I don't have that anymore. I have made a short list of things for me to try to do with myself for the next four weeks, and have committed to not buying any spirits at all for now, and only smoking if I've gone out and someone offers. I don't go out often, so this is generally sustainable for me. If there's anything any of you have done to get past the first few weeks and months of your breakup due to infidelity, I would certainly appreciate any advice. If you have made it this far, thanks a lot for reading. Hope you are getting along your journey and all right as well. If you are, then feel free to drop into the comments and let me know that it gets better because I need it. A first reaction comes from Throwaway Glade. If there's anything any of you have done in the past to get past the first few weeks and months of your breakup due to infidelity, I would certainly appreciate any advice. You've got most of it down. No drinking, no drugs, including cannabis. Speak often and frequently to friends. You'll be surprised by the amount of people who have gone through similar situations. <laughs> Do not cover for her bad actions. If people ask you why the you broke up, what happened, tell them. She's no longer your responsibility. Don't carry that burden. Attempt a new hobby, rekindle an old one, or, at the bare minimum, go for some walks. Do not force yourself to enjoy things you previously enjoyed. The want to do them will come back with time. Use the time to become comfortable with your emotions. Some days you'll barely be able to do anything, but this is normal. Embrace it and learn to navigate it. Use online tools like meetup.com, your local city discord, to meet new people and force yourself to socialize. I don't quite know how she moves on from this. She already has. This is just her cowardly way of trying to end a relationship she doesn't want to be in and pay it you as the abuser or villain. I did say that I hope we can be friends one day and I really do. We all do, but this is toxic as F. Hopium. Unless they go through significant healing or therapy to nail down why they did what they did, it's hopeless. A friend would never, ever treat you in such a way. Our next thought comes from Razor Chum. The amount of disrespect it takes to cheat on your part or verbally attack your physical confidence with that bit about how she feels about you physically does not make her someone you should hope to be friends with in the future. Good luck disentangling yourself from this woman, and when you do, I would consider making it permanent. One more comment before moving on from typing without thinking. The thought of me in bed made her sick. I should have called our relationship then. Do you think? This is honestly your biggest concern. Far more than her cheating on you, Far more than the ending of your relationship. You need to understand how you can remain in a relationship with someone who has no respect for you and no concern about your feelings. If you can't fix this problem, I fear you will never have a successful relationship. Counseling is your next step. Seriously. On to the next story. The morning of my marital metastasis. With a plea deal finally reached and new details brought to light. I have put myself back into therapy to deal with my ex-husband's pedophilia-based felonies. I used to be an avid amateur writer before all of this and have been struggling to get back into the pastime. Since restarting with a new therapist last week, I decided writing about reliving everything here would be an interesting set cordiary recovery and reclaiming my hobby. To set the scene, it was a brisk sunny morning mid-December back in 2018. The following events took place sometime after 9 a.m., which is a heinous hour to awaken a disgruntled mid-shift working healthcare professionals. But I already digress. There were several boomingly insistent knocks at the front door. Those were promptly followed by even more fervent banging of his persistently impatient fist. Still groggy from staying up with my then-husband, Alex, name-changed, until 5 a.m. I didn't pay it much mind. If it was a package, we'd time for it later. If a solicitor... Hardly worth the putting on of payets. Working till 3 a.m. most nights made me especially uninterested in the waking world till at least double digits. 
aka 10 a.m. Besides, the Sunday night before, we were both actually off and had stayed up till 5 a.m. catching up on RWBY. Not so fun fact, I've not been able to watch an episode of it ever since. It wasn't until the fifth round of knocking boomed harshly through the old wooden door of our still very new home that I was finally evicted from unconsciousness. Checking my phone, I literally saw the time and was filled with disgruntlement. Spoiler alert, this gruntlement would be the most positive feeling I experienced the rest of the day. Before I could even wipe the lingering sleep from my eyes, hurried footfalls stopped up the stairs and burst into our bedroom. I pulled the sheet up to my chest like a damn damsel in scandalized distress, while my then-husband, who shall henceforth be titled Tumor, was already up and passing a belt to jeans he had worn the day before. Several police officers entered our room and before I knew it, Tumor was ushered away and I was left alone with a lady of the law at the foot of my bed. Politely but sternly, she instructed me to get dressed. I asked if I was being taken anywhere, to which she non-committally assured me that I was not at this time. I then asked if I should dress warmly or professionally. Do I go for a t-shirt and sweatpants or slacks and a blouse? These were so very many questions plaguing my very muddled mind. I vividly remember her giving me a supportively sad smile before telling me it was cold, so something warm and comfortable. So, tea and sweats it was. Next up, I was asked about any weapons or electronics in the room. I directed her to both our closets, where we each had our own gun. Those were set on a bed, empty ammo cartridges removed, and empty air ejection ports exposed. My phone, along with older models long dead in my nightstand, MP3 players, cameras and touchpads were scattered across the still warm sheets of our bed. After all that, I was ushered out of the room before I could see what was they'd ransacked next. Another spoiler alert, I'd never be able to sleep on those again. Before I knew it, my life had become a scene in from a dramatized true crime special. I didn't know it at the time, but at least I wasn't the star. While the cocks raided our home, I sat on the couch watching helplessly while racking my brain over what I could have possibly done to bring them here. Because of course, it had to be me in trouble. I'm the troublemaker between the two of us. I always teased he was too self-righteous and far too lazy to actually do anything bad, let alone fiendishly illegal. But I had just paid all my outs any parking tickets off that Friday. What else could I have I done to warn at this? But very intended. At first, Tumor was nowhere in sight. I eventually caught a glimpse of him on the front porch through a window. He was surrounded by somehow even more cops while the rest of them were still swarming her home. Though I have to say it, it was much less trash raiding and far more politely poking and prodding about. Sometimes, they would pause to compliment me on the feature of the house, like the pocket doors or crowd molding along the ceiling. Each time I couldn't take the suspense anymore, I'd borderline hysterically thank them for the compliment before asking, So, what's happening? Why is this happening? Did I do something wrong? Am I accused of something? Are we being accused of something? Anything? Are we being taken anywhere? What's going on and when will I start getting some answers, please? Each time, I was gently but firmly brushed off. This was an ongoing investigation. Someone would speak to me soon. They weren't the ones who could. I'd have to continue to be patient. It wouldn't be much longer. So I continued to sit quietly, but internally, in very much active distress. At least my one roommate, Alexander, name also changed. But weird fact, he and Tumor shared a name. Sat with me. At least when he was in pacing. He's the unfortunate soul that answered the door to all the banging earlier. Something I'm still grateful for since when he did, he found the officers all too eagerly gung-ho getting ready to resort to a goddamn battering ram. They asked if he was Alexander, the owner of the house. He answered that while he was an Alexander, he wasn't that one. That man was upstairs in bed with his wife. The police then have him lead part of the way before sending him to the couch to sit and await for their confusion. After the first two hours of grilling Tumor on the front porch in the freezing cold, the police ushered him back inside to stand in the front hall instead. Between the human blockade of the folks in blue, we made eye contact for the first time since our bedroom door was unceremoniously slammed open. He gave me this look that felt like everything was going to be alright. That this was some sort of misunderstanding that he was taking care of. It was then that I overheard him bragging about his experiences with the martial art, Aikido, and the classes he used to take back in Jersey. He was telling a story I had heard a hundred times about a charismatically quirky instructor, arms up and face openly friendly towards the people detaining him in our home. And I relaxed. Because what sort of guilty moron discussed martial arts with the same officers in the process of arresting him? Well, apparently, the man I married was that moronic. 
or delusional. Probably both. In hindsight, yeah, definitely both. Eventually, he was escorted outside again and I was left to my own tumultuous thoughts until the lead detective finally called my name. He had a kind face. I remember that as distinctly as I do the warmly firm and comforting handshake just before he led me into my kitchen as though he was the polite host. The thing looked too rummaged through, a fact that gave me some measure of hope that everything was going to be all right. That lasted until he informed me exactly what and why they were arresting my now very ex-husband. The denial phase of my grief lasted right up until he finished explaining Toomer's accusations, their evidence, and I had a friend summarized what was written in the search for and affidavit. Just four more stages to go, 